Um, okay, so most of us did not uh, join earlier sessions, so we're coming in sort of fresh. Uh, I watched uh, for the past couple, two and a half hours, uh, really amazing speakers uh, covered a wide variety of topics. Um, and this session is supposed to be a summary session today for the benefit of our of our uh, attendees and participants who are who are not speakers to hear us sort of summarize um, what took place in uh, throughout the day. So I think that's going to be a little bit difficult if the majority of us didn't uh, didn't tune in. But just for the benefit of kicking off, I'm going to say I've taken a few notes of topics that were covered throughout the day and share those with you, and then we can touch on those as we each uh, introduce ourselves and give our give our comments. Would that be okay? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm going to go through these rather rather quickly. Um, the economic slowdown happening in India, um, the the complete mess that exists today in the U.S. And these are in no particular order, but just as they came out uh, with the political situation as well as the economic situation, the U.S.-China trade wars and how that's affecting the world and what what position in that India might take. The convergence of interest between an alignment between India and the U.S. as gaining um, stature as the rest of the world seems to fall apart and fall apart, and the importance of that relationship to, main, to help maintain stability between Asia and Europe and the U.S. Um, COVID, obviously, a lot of talk about COVID. Uh, the fact that it's going to be a five-year, uh, probably a five-year dilemma, and and it might be accelerating the uh, transition from many countries into the new normal or the sort of new world, new world economics, new world relationships, uh, new patterns of behavior, new spending, new investment, uh, the importance of climate change and how that is coming at all of us a lot faster than we realize. And COVID somehow has see, uh, risen to take center stage uh, over and above uh, climate change, change was just six to 12 months ago was one of the number one topics on our on our minds as we sit down. Um, the China factor, just the, the uh, hegemonist uh, behavior of China trying to have a top-down uh, approach to the world uh, as opposed, uh, I may say, to the Indian and U.S. Uh, and European approach, which is a lot more democratic and, co and collaborative rather than uh, top-down. And so forth. I mean, the Trump era, ener energy, uh, supply chain disruption, um, the fourth industrial revolution, and the merger of technology and man, uh, and how that's going to shape up. Um, the need, uh, the need for optimism in times of uh, of great distress and, and great stress that we're going through. Working from home, figuring out how we're going to keep our families and our employees uh, uh, fed. Um, a lot of talk about the global order. Uh, there, the, the uh, World War II, ending of World War II, uh, 75 years ago, and now a lot of those institutions and relationships are just seem to be coming apart of the scene. What role would and should India play as we uh, sort of recreate the world order among among countries? So I have a lot more here, but those are some of the topics, and you're all familiar with the global agenda. Uh, and I think as India and as we as leaders uh, relate to the world uh, post-COVID are the topics that our audience is going to be interested to hear about today. We have about a thousand people dialing in and listening to our uh, to your uh, wisdom and esteemed comments. So those are just my opening thoughts to try to begin set the stage um, I could go on, but Moen is over here smiling, saying, okay, John, your time is up. Uh, now, I would like to call on each of you to introduce yourselves very very briefly for 30 seconds. Who who are you? Where are you? What's your role in life? Which perch in the tree do you occupy? And then, and then some comments uh, about these topics and about uh, your favorite passionate uh, topics. Uh, for today, which I've asked you on our rehearsal last week. Uh, Rudra, can I ask you to start off? Sure. Thank you, John. I'm Rudra Chatterjee. I'm chairman of a home furnishings company called OBT, which manufactures carpets in UP and 
furniture in Jaipur. Uh, more than 20,000 people uh, work in the carpet uh, industry uh, and uh, in our company. I also am the managing director of a company called Lakshmi Tea, which owns tea estates in India and in Africa, producing uh, 25 million kgs of tea. So in terms of the porch I look at is basically manufacturing, especially labor intensive manufacturing. And uh, in terms of the areas that I'm most interested in, in, and I pointed out, is I think we will have to look at inequality once more. India has always had a lot of inequality. And uh, I think many of the things that we are reacting to at this time is going to help with uh, reducing inequality. I think that is a little different from what you know the Oxford and Alrika spoke about. I think when we are looking at agriculture, the fact that we can now have agriculture sold directly to anybody, this is a remarkable change um, from a socialist agricultural control where farmers could only sell to uh, restricted uh, areas. And also what we've seen with the migrant crisis, I think will shake us up and make us react that there are millions and millions of Indians who need social security, not just unionized workers who are working in a few factories. So that, I think, is one area I want to speak on. The other area is in terms of whether B2B will merge into B2C because of online sales, because of shrinking margins, and the fact that, you know, why do you buy and pay, you know, 20%, 30% more? Um, that's because of rent, employee costs, and many of the things that we are not using today. And we, today, you know, I have personally experienced in you know, ordering my, um, you know, some of the goods directly from manufacturers and getting a much better deal. So whether, you know, I think from a consumption pattern, how that will change. But uh, very, uh, you know, I, I'm greatly looking forward to hearing the rest of the uh, fantastic panelists. here. So you're basically, you're addressing the question there, Rudra, about the disintermediation, the, the, That's right. the, this disruption and the opportunity which is coming about through disintermediation uh, uh, facilitated by the internet. Absolutely, yeah. By internet the, and, and uh, shrinking margins. And you know, shrinking it, it, right, okay, great, great. Uh, Dil, thank you very much. Uh, Dilip, could you go next, please? Sure, thank you, John. Um, I work with a company called Perfect Relations. We are a communications company. We have corporations, both large and small, to communicate better. And at the moment, uh, that is, uh, can I say, a fairly critical function for a lot of companies in India who are either laying off people or starting new lines of business or shutting down old lines of business. So that in that shift, we play the role of helping to communicate with uh, their shareholders, their stakeholders. So that's essentially what I do. It's a fairly uh, large company. We employ about uh, 300 people who are professionals in this business. And um, my space on the perch is really looking at media, looking at new tools of communication, and looking at the emergence of digital as the new platform on which all of us will be spending more time uh, than in the real world um, with or without COVID. Uh, what I'd like to talk about um, is related to this is essentially how poised Indian companies are to make this change, to grapple with it, what it does in terms of uh, the, the inequality that was just referred to by Rudra and also what it does to the fact that increasingly geography is now being um, being rendered, shall I say, largely useless. Uh, it's, geography is becoming history, as it were. So these are the issues that I would like to uh, spend time on, and I'm happy to engage on any of the other subjects which anyone may want to um, have more, more during the course of our conversation. So I'll stop here, John. 
and let you move on to the next person. Okay, fantastic. The great topics. My wife is in communications. So I uh, look forward to hearing some of your thoughts on that. Next uh, in line, Vineet Gonka, could you uh, introduce yourself and your interesting career and uh, perspectives? Yeah, hi, everybody. My name is Vineet, and I thought of migrating out of IBM in 2003 in the political space, and I joined the political space after leaving the corporate world. Uh, grew from a booth-level activist of BJP to become the national co-convener of IT cell, that information technology cell, uh, led the elections uh, in 2014, and then I uh, and Mohan Das, by whom you see in the screen, we both of us were put in a task force, which was for Ministry of Road, Transport, Highway and Shipping. Uh, post the task force submitted the report of modernization. Uh, then I was asked to join the railways as governing council member of railways prestigious CRIS, uh, which looks after the IT. And uh, to tell you about my passion, there is something called as Antodaya. Uh, Antodaya is a Sanskrit word, which means uh, when the last person in the queue is uh, taken care of, when the end is been taken care of. So I've been striving for that. Uh, I was a naughty student, uh, learned only two digits in mathematics class, that is zero and one. So I always played in data, never went to two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I always was with zero, one in my life. And I've been there. Uh, you can see behind me, uh, that's the thing which I play with data. Uh, I'm an always in a protectionist. So I talk about data sovereignty, uh, sovereignty data localization talk about how do the data makes difference in the democracy. So I mix up data and democracy. That's my introduction more as the panel goes on. Fantastic. What a great mind you have to be able to marry those two topics together in the interest of, uh, of India. Uh, next, uh, Shamit, could I ask you to get, introduce yourself, uh, which perch you sit on and your, uh, your worldview and some comments starting off? Thanks, John. Um, guys, my name is Shamit. Uh, I live in Delhi and I work at a company called Synapse India, which was founded by me in 1999. Uh, we are a software provider to many e-commerce uh, stores across the world. And uh, I, I reciprocate what Rudra said about the B2B and B2C really merging. So that's something that's a very interesting comment and I would love to discuss more on that. Uh, the perch that I sit on is uh, software, like I mentioned, technology industry. And my passion points are sustainability, accountability, and responsibility as a nation, as people, as communities. Okay, uh, fantastic. Very, very succinct, a lot packed in a few words. Uh, next, Mohan, can I call on you, my friend? Uh, you, who are you? Where are you? What's, what's your worldview? Which perch do you sit on? And uh, and what are your comments? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, John. Good to be here. Well, uh, my name is Mondas Pai. I'm the chairman of Arian Capital Partners and 314 Capital, both venture capital funds. We have totally about 14 funds and 250 startups with $450 million investment. We get 3,000 startups coming to see us every year for capital. So I work in a very exciting area. My interest is in geopolitics, just to understand how the world is going to change after COVID, because primarily COVID has exposed the global fault lines with China becoming a great power, a very uncertain great power trying to be a hegemon. The United States trying to bring up his own power, ignoring Europe with President Trump and trying to take care of internal contradictions in his own economy and going through certain case of turmoil American exceptionalism is under challenge globally, Europe losing out, Japan shrinking in importance. So I think in the next few years, we're going to see the West with U.S. leading India somewhere in the middle. And India will possibly align with the U.S. after what China has done, because China has become a global threat, just like the Soviet Union was reckoned for the West. So now we have to see a rearrangement of global politics and the impact will be very, very wide because China is the largest exporter, largest importer largest quantum of reserves, 24% of global manufacturing comes from China, and you can't escape that. The second issue which I have a deep interest is how technology is going to change the world uh, because we are seeing an inflection point where out of 7.6 billion people, possibly 5.5, 6 billion will have a mobile connection by the end of this year. Maybe 5, 5.5 five billion will be on the internet, and the internet is creating new business models. We are seeing the rise of global monopolies like Apple, Amazon, and Google, and these global monopolies have enormous amount of power, huge market value. 
nobody could believe we'll have a one and a half trillion dollar company and we see that happening and people are talking of going to two trillion dollars. We are seeing enormous amount of information available on these portals and great power to manipulate the mind. So I think in technology, we're going to see countries coming up to try to get some digital rights. We need a universal declaration of digital rights. Uh, John, just like in 1946, we had the human universal declaration of human rights. You need digital rights to protect us against digital monopolies. We got Vinit fighting against a digital monopoly in this country. And how and technology is going to impact every single person. Like one of the panelists said, technology will eliminate the middleman in the entire supply chain. So the supply chain, which came up in the industrial revolution, which got perfected in the Second World War, is now going to dramatically change. Because through the web, we're going to see the internet and consumers connected together with specialists handling the supply chain and costs coming down. So every industry, be it banking, uh, be it manufacturing, be it retail, uh, be it hospitality, is getting impacted. The last point, the last point is how is how are we going to live on this planet, uh, which is undergoing massive climate change? I'm sure Midula will talk about that because we have seen hope. Uh, when the lockdown came, we saw most countries see the blue sky. We had fresh air in many of our water bodies. We saw fresh water coming. Now, when we, are we going to go back to old ways? How is that going to impact business? What are we supposed to do to make sure that we change our ways? The role of alternate energy, the decline of big oil, etc., is going to impact the world in a dramatic way. So these are the three things that uh, will impact. Will, I would like to discuss. And I think India is going to be the heart of all this because India has to lead the way. We are $3 trillion now. We have a great chance of becoming $10 trillion by 2030, maybe 2032, one or two years ahead. And then we'll have a great influence in the world. So I think, you know, these are the points I'd like to discuss, John. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mohan. That's, that's fantastic. I look forward to discussing those points with you and getting uh, your input and the other people. Uh, those are all transformational and important. Next, Medulla, can we ask you to uh, step up and introduce yourself. Your who are you? Where are you? Uh, what are your what perch do you sit on? Hi, uh, thanks, John, and thanks, uh, John. I, I really think uh, you know you structuring this uh, conversation made it much easier for all for all of us, and especially for me. Thank you. Um, in terms of uh, who I am, I wear three hats. One is I'm the executive director of Sundram Textiles. We are a yarn manufacturer, so we're a very labor intensive industry, and as as textiles, we're the largest employer of women outside agriculture, right? And we've been hit. We've received a body blow from the COVID lockdowns. So that gives me that perspective. Secondly, I'm the, I'm the author of uh, The Climate Solution, and I regularly write on climate change, and I run Sundrum Climate Institute, where we focus on last-mile solutions on waste and water. So that gives me a vantage point of seeing how India, the single most vulnerable country to climate change, has um, has to keep in mind while changing. I mean, if you think the lockdowns and uh, managing, you know, contact tracing is hard now, imagine doing this when your cities are flooded. Okay, uh, that sort of gives you a perspective of the kind of challenges we're dealing with. Um, you know, the third uh, vantage point I want to put is, I, uh, not to the extent of uh, Mr. Baide, but uh, I invest in climate change related startups. And I think that opens up in uh, what is typically considered a very depressing topic, uh, tremendous avenues of hope. So uh, we can view climate change and water crises as a constraint. Indeed, they are, but they're also tremendous sources of opportunity. And uh, this brings me to what I'd like to talk about, my passion points for today. I think any change that we come up with in a post-COVID world, uh, in India, we cannot keep the climate change outside. Uh, you know, we cannot take out the climate change lens. So that's the first thing I want to look at. The second thing I want to look at is there are democratic realities, you know, of how to make that possible. I think if we don't understand that, this is just going to be a nice conversation in air-conditioned rooms. Uh, thirdly, to take advantage of that, we need to make sure our people are skilled. Again, I come from, you know, manufacturing. Most of my workers, if I would tell them to take advantage of the digital economy, it's going to be difficult. But at the same time, today I have sensors on every single spindle running on my machine. And that has just, you know, skyrocketed my technology. So we need to think of education and skill sensitivity. So these are the three things I'd like to talk about. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. 
Very interesting uh, that you tie all those together, uh, some old world technologies and new world uh, tech technologies and how do they, how do they marry together? Uh, Gregory, your last but not least, you're, I think you're dialing in from New Zealand, if I'm not sure. So if I'm not mistaken, so it's time for your morning coffee pretty soon, right? Yes. It's, um, what is uh, it? 2, two fifty AM in the morning here. Oh, uh, um, and I've been, uh, in a, the first session. So I, I pretty well much followed probably half of the, half of the day, um, been very very interesting and uh thank you very much john and to frank um and all all the other participants um i'm a principal and md of uh, my own business uh tail hit new zealand um uh, i'm experienced across innovation design technology and entrepreneurial ecosystems uh 25 years of design led and uh future thinking um i'm industry agnostic uh, sector and technology as agnostic as a strategic advisor. Um, uh, I won't sort of go into my history about what I've done. I've done many different things. I've lived in six countries and worked around the world in various places, uh, visited, had the pleasure of visiting India twice um, in the nineties and the two thousands. Um, my uh, continued passion is uh working on what I term uh, info uh, mimicry. Um, it's about extending my thinking and R&D on information, uh, both as and about something. It, it's replication and it's two-way transaction between the physical and digital worlds, moving towards a regenerative future on planet Earth. Um, in the context of today's meeting, uh, money is a virtual idea. Its physicality uh, was hard materialized, firstly in clay, then metal, and then into paper in the form of cash. Um, this is an example of the two combined, um, both as information about and as something. Over the past 30 years, uh, we've continued to digitize and money um, is becoming more virtual and less visible. Mm -hmm. During the time, during this time, previous economic crises, and particularly the GFC, has uh, resulted in social um, inequity, but these have b been all virtual crises. Um, today's COVID has brought on one which is both social and economic, and and human and in the physical world. It's a, therefore, it's a physical world crisis uh, yet to be foreseen how this will play out. Um, what, what I see COVID um, is accelerating is a new divide between the physical world and the human built digital world. Um, for me, the use of vernacular is gonna become fundamentally important as we move forward. The term of Social distancing, to me, is a false positive. What is required is physical distancing while encouraging better and social and uh, better and equitable social socialization. Um, there's been a lot of talk today, John, as you pour it out about the fourth industrial revolution, which is really about the future of work debate, and we shouldn't ignore and. Uh, at the addressing of the ethical use of artificial intelligence and robotic automation and biotech engineering. Um, this, this COVID brings into the forefront new aspects uh, into the future of work. This is illustrated by the work that can be done purely digitally or virtual. And, and in fact, during lockdowns and beyond uh, beyond these workers, products and services, in fact, benefited from COVID um, in the digital world versus the work that has to take place and requires in the physical world. I've, I've got a lot to say about the various things in this space, but really what I'm looking at here is, um, you know, is, is 
we are moving towards a further disconnection between rural communities and that uh, we are from the natural world and the dependency on it for our physiological needs, food, water, warmth, energy, and shelter. I'm very interested in disrupting those foundational layers at Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, so it, it, it's, it's not about really... The, it, so, so now it's about the future of livelihood, um, new life and new neighbourhoods. To put it simply, you can't bite bites. <laughs> you can't what? You can't bite bites. You can't bite bites. Yeah, no, that's that's interesting. And then you got on top of that, you've got all the space exploration going on. So here we here you're addressing all the sort of con conflicts and confluences of what's happening in the physical and, and the virtual digital world here on space. But before long, uh, with Elon Musk and others, we'll be ferrying ourselves off to Mars, and who knows where this whole experiment called humanity is going to wind up right? Um, we're bringing up, I think, some really fundamental questions, and we're living in very fundamentally changing times. The, the, the challenges and cross crossing between technology and, uh, and the old ways of the world, and, uh, and the, agri the fourth industrial revolution going from uh, ag agrarian to manufacturing to, you know, to the information age that we're in and globalization. Um, and so that's all sort of touching on the political uh, transition of society. So with that, I would like to ask Vinit, uh, if you, from your, wearing your, your BJP uh, hat, and also as a, leading, as a leader in the Indian uh, thought space, looking at India internally and the, and the world externally, and coming to uh, Frank's challenge for us in this, in this session, the roadmap for India's transition. Okay. Yeah, well, I think, you know, uh, we have shown a, a lot of change and I can tell you on the personal end also, nobody could have predicted in January that we would be talking today like this and rather not meeting each other or not trying to uh, travel across the oceans and then having seminars. So this was unpredictable. And this global lockdown, if it has affected not only the human mind, the global mobility, the disruption which we have seen in the world supply chain, I think it is unprecedented. We have never seen this kind of uh, disruption which is there. At least I had not thought about. When I used to work with IBM, we used to have a three-letter word called as BCP, business continuity process. Then uh, in, on, in the political system also, we have business continuity process where we have many things been put there. But I don't think so that any master of BCP would have actually put uh, this in perspective that one day we are going to be at home, everything being locked, not able to see the neighbor. So probably that was not been seen. But I would like to tell you one thing. The biggest ally or biggest uh, savior is today's technology and what my country has shown is something uh, great. We have used technology to the core. As I said, my passion is to meet the last one in the line. And the last one in the line, and we have plenty of them. We have plenty of them whom you call as to be the BPL or the below poverty line uh, beneficiary. My brothers who do not have enough to eat. And I think we serve them as government uh, with tool of technology. We uh, tied in something called as Aadhaar, which was a unique identity card. Uh, number which is like a social security number we joined in Jandhan Yojanas that is the banks and then we give them the biggest direct benefit transfer I don't think so in the entire globe there is a government which could have transferred this much of volume of money to so many million people at a time across the globe the size is enormous you can actually go and talk about this and then see when the global uh, lockdown started we also followed the lockdown we had people who were covid carriers who were suspected covid carriers and we wanted to know how many of them are there in one particular area what is the density so that we can give them healthcare services and then we brought in this arogya setu app the app which talks about contact uh, tracing we could identify how many people are so that we can give the g2 services the health uh, care services, yes, being the country of such a large number of people who were exposed to this thing, there were challenges. But I can tell you one thing. I had never thought uh, we will use lockdown to our advantage. And I'm very proud that our people actually walked up to this. We were all uh, advocating G2C. Mohan and I have been uh, pushing the agenda through our task force whenever we were in the members of the task force. And we could see reluctance. Reluctance because everybody likes the status quo. So be it be bureaucracy, be it be citizens or be it be people like us who are in the politics. We talk about all the things in the seminar, but go back home. We would like to have the status quo. But this three months helped us to push 
G2C on digital platform, which people were able to do that. I could see now people taking ration. Now, ration is the food, uh, guaranteed food, uh, which has been given by government of India to the people who can't buy them. And this could be delivered anywhere in the geography. Just think about a person from Agartala getting his ration delivered in Mumbai. The size is like one part of Europe to another part of Europe. So we have been delivering this irrespective of where he is. And this adaptability to the technology, I think that changed the perspective of the people. And I see this as to be a very, very big uh, opportunity where we can transit things from uh, normal businesses to this. Now, let me tell you, we were all advocating uh, when can the courts migrate to e-court? And I had never thought that it will happen in my uh, lifetime. We have been pushing through judiciary across the world. It's been conventional. They have been reluctant to migrate to technology. But in the last three months, I could see not only the Supreme Court, which is the uh, apex court of India, but even metropolitan magistrates have migrated. I have an example. Somebody moved a petition in Mumbai on a weekend and he gets a call in 2100 hours in the night. And this gentleman was actually very happy because he never thought courts work 24 by 7. Now you see that they are working and that would give the citizens guarantee of justice. Justice was not given to them because it was not available 24 by 7. And I can now see that justice being delivered in India 24 by 7. So that's going to be a big uh, impact. Let me tell you about my organization. I work with railways very closely, being a governing council member of the railways. And what is Indian Railway? You know, 19,000 trains run in these railways. We have more than 12,000 uh, trains per day carrying more than 23 million passengers. Now, 23 million passengers means population of many, many countries of Europe probably. They travel from one end to another end. And what is the one end to another end? If I take one station to another station, the distance can be 3 kilometers and the distance can be 3,000 kilometers. We are talking about 7,000 freight trains carrying out more than 3 million tons. 3 million tons of freight per day. Now, this is what the entire Australia eats in a year, probably. So that's what we transport in the day kind of thing. Now, the spread is 65,000 root kilometers. Actual spread is more than 115,000 kilometers. But this, and when we talk about this, the migration which will happen because of this lockdown, where we were reluctant to push technology, probably this is going to happen. Geospatial technology, may it be IoT, will be pushed in. I'll just give you one example. If you come to India and you happen to travel on train, every coach which carries people have four toilets. Each toilet has a small water uh, tank overhead. And there are challenges. Many times when you're traveling, the water gets exhausted. There is no water. And then the human, the passenger who's traveling, suffers. Now, can I put in an IoT device there which can tell the next station master what is the level of the water? Just think about the smile which will be there on the face of my passengers. Now, that's what we are thinking about today, to migrate from the conventional system of services and railway to what we can do. It. Think about, can I reduce the cost of railway by doing, you know, coming out of uh, the old systems. Now, here I'm going to have challenges. We are going to have challenges of colonization. We will have people who will try to push their data, who are going to push their agenda. We will be seeing that uh, data will travel across the globe. And once the data travels across the globe, there will be challenges who would like to analyze the data, use that in their own interest. So there are people uh, whom we are going to fight, who are going to push in cyberbullying or who are going to try to impact our democracy. Just think about the incidents. If my neighbors want to sell my tickets without my permission, just think about somebody who's traveling and he sees three other people who are coming. That will create a situation. And I'm very proud that the boys who are working there are been delivering and we don't have a single incidence where we have been uh, caught unaware. So I think probably this particular lockdown is been seen in India to be a boon uh, on the digital side. While we were struggling to push in agendas which are digital, uh, probably uh, Prime Minister Modi is uh, fighting on all the front. He's going to tackle about the health care systems. He's going to see, see the geopolitical things. But one thing which is going to happen is the Atma Nirbhar Bharat through a digital route. We are going to push in more digital technology. Maybe probably, uh, as Bridalaji rightly said, we, there may be suffering of uh, when you don't have people to support textile, maybe uh, that will happen. But then we, there will be technology. And we have seen today, many, many companies have come up, which have started working remotely. We may have things which are uh, new. Disruption may not, I may not be having answers right now. But yes, like I said, uh, we are meeting. This is the first time when I can see international speakers coming together very seriously, uh, being listening to each other, watching, talking. Uh, had we thought about this a year back, answer is no. Even being from the IT industry, I don't think so. We would have thought about this kind of thought. So, Thank you.
Thank you. Let me let me uh, rotate around a little bit. Get some other uh, other inputs. Um, um, Radula, you have a an interesting uh, perspective um, on on use. I think using technology on climate uh, climate uh, challenges. Uh, and how do you see India playing a role in, this is not just an India problem, this is a global problem. Um, thank you, John. I think the, the point I want to make is many of us see climate change as a constraint and water crises as a constraint. After all, I mean, if you don't have water, there's, there's not much you can do. But I think, you know, I mean, if you look at Israel, it's a, it's a desert that essentially exports both fresh water and exports virtual water through the crops it produces and then sells. So when you when you really look at um, climate change and water as an opportunity, I'm going to talk about two things. I'm going to talk about waste management in cities uh, because one of the you know contributors to flooding is actually when you choke all your waterways with waste. The second thing is actually sewage treatment. Uh, you know, India treats a very minuscule portion of its sewage and uh, we need to have decentralized sewage treatment and that actually, pro you know, is a tremendous job creation opportunity. If you manage your waste properly, and this is not just theoretical numbers I'm spewing out, I mean, through my investments, I see the kind of jobs that come in. Um, you can create hundreds of thousands of good quality jobs, decentralized jobs, which is really what India needs. I mean, when you look at the mig uh, migrant situation, you need decentralized jobs. I mean, this is industry that can really proliferate. And why I believe India can be a leader for uh, technology for the world is most startups fail because they, uh, they don't think about the customer fit very well. So if you're sitting in a university in a developed country and developing a product for a developing country, you're missing, you know, the technology is not the most cool part of a startup in this space. It's things like how are you doing your, you know, what is the payment options you're giving? What are the finance options you're giving? What are the maintenance service options you're giving? What language do you address your customers? You know, those are the interesting things. And, you know, this way, um, India, if you look at it, look at our population, it's also an advantage. We have, you know, 20 Israels possible in each city. And um, if I may, I, I think that's what makes it democratically more interesting also. You don't need to put a national regulation where a citywide regulation will do. And that might be much more easier to do as uh, Bangalore has shown. Um, again, the same thing for sewage treatment. You don't need a national regulation. You're going to create thousands of jobs at the city level. I have, and, a, I have a question for you, Madula. So, you know, you just cited Israel. <clears throat> Israel. And I have many friends in Israel. I've worked there. Israel is a, they call it the startup nation. <clears throat> and it's interesting to see that they have come up with water solutions, which have turned the desert into, into uh, fertile land. So they can actually export fruits and vegetables to the region and feed their people. Now, India, I'm just posing this as a question, is a country, as you said, that has a, uh, a, mass, a lot of massive problems that it has to solve, among them sewage. Do you see um rem remedies uh that uh the technology innovation clusters in india are inventing that could be like israel did that could be invented here i mean in Isra in in india and which could become then exported to other markets where they need solutions maybe africa where maybe low cost low technology solutions do you see anything in in that space I think India is a giant domestic market. Okay, so let me just start off with that. Um, no need, no need to go. Uh, no, look, I mean, it's nice. It's a nice to have. It's the icing on the cake. But I think the cake is big enough that you know there's enough to go around. But you know, there is a small issue on why we're not seeing innovation at scale, and the simple reason is water is not priced at a meaningful enough amount. And I think a lot of people hide behind the poor, saying the poor need water. But, you know, our research shows, and I think this is backed up by a lot of people, that the poor actually pay one of the highest prices of water in India, both in terms of, uh, you know, rupee price, as well as the price they pay for in time and health. Mm -hmm. So I think if we get a meaningful price, again, this is not a national battle. So it needs to be thought of city by city basis. Okay. Um, 
when I came to India my first trip uh, about 20 years ago, and then again more intensively about 10 years ago, I was completely taken aback by the the opposite that actually exists in India versus what you hear around the world. You know, poverty and and uh, ghettos and so forth. I mean, it's a it's a country of talent, innovation, uh, global connect connectivity, uh, a moral compass, if you will. Uh, and I, my view is a lot to teach the world and a lot to be able to lead the world uh, in these turbulent times that we're in. I was amazed when I was in Bangalore that some of the companies I was involved in in the uh, BPO space are actually running half the U.S.'s uh, large technology companies like like Moen knows from Infosys, uh, companies that are that are actually running the core background, the core, the backbone uh, of these of these uh, of these large enterprises, and and that is a trend that I see happening more and more and more. Uh, if you can manage the data, manage the knowledge, manage the transfers, you can manage the world. Um, and that, but there's also a big element of trust that's involved in that for companies in Europe, companies in the U.S., companies in, in anywhere around the world to say, okay, here's all our data, here's all our challenges, supply chain. Uh, data security um, and so forth. Moen, do you see uh, a macro sort of environment uh, um, evolution where India is doing that on a larger and larger scale, helping a, a, in terms of leadership with the world and how to manage itself? John, absolutely. I think we are totally integrated with the innovation and technology system of the whole world, primarily the West. Uh, let me give some data. The U.S. has 6 million people in software, out of which 1 million are Indians there. 25% of all startups in Silicon Valley have an Indian founder. 35% India has about 4.5 million people working in technology. 2 million work for American companies. Out of 8 million working for American companies, 3 million are Indians. Now, they deal with security. They deal with uh, all the data which is confidential. They're very trusted. And they're part of the team. Most Western enterprises look at the outsource Indian partners as part of the whole team and they have kept the trust for the last 25, 30 years. And why is that? Because we understand that trust is the most important thing in business. And if you should keep the trust of a customer and we all become part of their enterprise and we have helped them make, we help make them efficient. Last year, 2020 March, uh, India exported $150 billion of software services. The street price of $150 billion is $200 billion of the United States. They're the biggest thing that's happening now in, the, in technology, in um, innovation. Uh, we, India is very large. We just saw some data. We said that about 15% uh, of all the people working in AI in the world are Indians. Many of them in American companies, many of them in European companies. There are about uh, maybe 10% of uh, half of them have got degrees from Indian universities, but working for American companies. But the West and India are totally integrated. We are part of the same ecosystem. And against us, we have China, which has been self-contained under the wall, under the big Chinese firewall. So I think, you know, John, what you're speaking is a new global order where India is fully integrated. But, you know, that is a top part of India. Now, India is a, it's got different layers. And we need to understand all these layers. So when you come to India, you must not be shocked because, one, never try to understand India. India is too complex for most of us to understand. Mm -hmm. Just experience India. See the different layers. But what you see, John, is very unique. Most people are contented. They're, they're happy with their circumstances. They're fighting for better things. Today, John, let me tell you, the poorest woman in the country will want a child to be a, a, go to college and be a graduate. She'll eat one meal less, sacrifice everything. So it is the Indian family system. The last point I want to make, John, you asked, how can this country be poor? We were the richest country at one point of time till Great Britain came and colonized us. And there is an article written by, uh, you know, Usta Patnaik of Columbia University in the U.S., which says the total wealth that was looted by the British is equal to $45 trillion today. If they had come to you, Switzerland, and taken your money, you'll be worse off than us, uh, John. So you got to wait for India to grow. And we're going to be right there, John. But, you know, we are a part of the new global order where we can work with each other, trust with each other. You know, John, you are an investor in Indian startups. You've seen some great entrepreneurs. You've seen how we can trust them. We're going to have to cut off now in respect of time. Uh, Frank has set the second session starting right now. So 
I want to thank everybody for all of your comments. I'm sorry everybody didn't get a chance to, uh, to weigh in again. But uh, we'll have a chance to meet at the next uh, Harasses meeting in person and have a toast. Thank you, John. John. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you.